Welcome everybody to this uh, third uh, webinar in the uh, in the webinar series from uh, from Afri Alliance. Um, we have um, we have a number of um, of uh, speakers with us uh, today, and I'll and I'll run through exactly who those uh, who those are. Um, but yeah, just to uh, let you know that the uh, this webinar is uh, on how to create uh, sustainable communities of practice, or as we've called them in in Afri Alliance action groups. In, uh, in Africa on water and uh, climate uh, activities. My name is, uh, is David Smith, and I'll be running through uh, this webinar uh, with you. I'm from the uh, consulting company WMB, and I'm joined by my uh, colleague uh, Matthias uh, uh, Brumer, also from, uh, from WMB, and uh, Luke Somerville from IHG Delft, and uh, Mark Graham from, uh, from Ground Truth uh, in South Africa who is leading the Ubuntu Action Group. He's uh, with a, a few colleagues of his who will tell us a little bit more about uh, the action groups, how they are run on, on the ground. So to give you a bit of a, an outline of the, of the agenda that we'll be uh, running through today, I'll give you a brief overview of the, uh, of the Afri Alliance uh, action groups, how they were set up, why they were set up, uh, and how they've uh, been running up to this, uh, this point. My colleague Matthias will uh, will run through some of the sustainability criteria that we've uh, that we've come out with uh, following uh, a few sessions with uh, with the action groups and other stakeholders uh, across uh, across Africa to have an idea of what can constitute a uh, a sustainable action group. Luke will be doing much the same uh, uh, idea, but the insights that he will be giving us are from the Afri Alliance MOOCs where we had. Uh, a number of uh, um, African practitioners uh, participate, and uh, there again we ask the uh, the question: What, in, in fact, can constitute a sustainable action group or indeed a community of practice? Mark will give us a, a good outline and a rundown of what are the sustainability experiences from uh, from the field in terms of the Ubuntu action group. Before we open up the forum for um, for questions from uh, from all of you. But what I might uh, suggest at this point is that uh, in the chat, uh, you have the ability to ask a question and to raise a, a point of discussion or of debate, uh, whatever you feel would be, uh, would be an interesting topic to, uh, to discuss while we run through this entire presentation. So you can put that there in the, in the chat and uh, we can note those down and we run through those uh, during the open forum session at the end. Alternatively, uh, we will be uh, able to open your, your mics so that you can uh, give us uh, perhaps feedback from, uh, from yourself um, in terms of uh, your own experiences on, on, on action groups or communities or practice or any other question that you might have in, relate to, in relation to that. So we've opened that space uh, about 25 minutes for, uh, for that to, to happen. So just to give you a, a bit of a context around uh, Afri Alliance and, and some of the main or the, really the main objective that we had uh, during this project. Obviously, it's a project financed by the, uh, the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 banner, with its uh, main objective is to bring together African and European uh, stakeholders uh, in the areas of uh, water innovation, climate uh, research, policy, and capacity development. And basically, that is really trying to look to strengthen the preparedness of, of Africa in the face of the climate change vulnerabilities that it's currently facing. In order to do this, um, Afri Alliance has really considered the network of networks uh, because we brought together a number of African and European networks that are involved in water and climate activities. So as you can see, we've uh, covered the entire African uh, uh, continent through connecting these different uh, networks on water and climate activities. And from the European side, we've done much the same thing with a number of uh, different uh, networks and associations that are bringing together many practitioners across the European continent, as well as specialized uh, research centers and uh, consultancies such as ourselves that focus on specific aspects where we can bring our expertise into this project. When we look at the, uh, the idea of uh, action groups and uh, communities of practice, we had this initial concept of uh, being demand-driven, bottom-up uh, focused. But if we have a, a, a bit of a concept of what is an action group or what is a community of practice uh, as such, 
really is just a, a group of uh, people that are coming together that have a, a common concern or a common focus over a particular aspect and the way to solve that particular uh, aspect is uh, to collaborate uh, together in, in order to, uh, to solve that particular issue. There, there are three main uh, characteristics of, uh, of an action group uh, or a community of practice. Basically, the sense is that the, uh, the members are able to, uh, to interact uh, together, that they form relationships and a culture within that action group uh, itself. The whole purpose of it is to build those uh, relationships and enable them to work on specific uh, uh, areas of interest. And, and basically, the final point is to, uh, to look to continually develop this, uh, this community uh, where members are able to produce results by coming together. And whether these are new procedures, uh, techniques, uh, success stories, different types of tools, pilot projects, uh, that sort of thing. And Mark will be able to run through these, uh, these aspects and tell us a little bit about their own personal experience uh, as he comes in towards the end of this, this webinar. From the Afri Alliance point of view, we, uh, we created 10 uh, action groups across the African continent. And uh, these were set up in two lots. The first lot was set up in 2016 of five, and that was followed in 2018 by the second lot of uh, five action groups. And as I mentioned, they were bottom-up and demand-driven. So they were completely open to decide on which uh, activities they wanted to focus, as long as it was uh, settled within certain themes that, uh, that from, from current studies, current literature, and, and current concerns uh, at the African and European level, uh, we, uh, we, we detailed what were those uh, particular themes to focus on, whether it was on coastal regions, uh, uh, urban areas, uh, uh, rivers, wetlands, that sort of thing. And so you can see here from the range of uh, action groups that uh, that came forward, there's all sorts of different aspects that were being uh, focused on or currently being worked on. Uh, we have from water harvesting uh, uh, potential to uh, drought mitigation uh, to water stewardship uh, and indeed uh, the uh, Ubuntu action group on the citizen based water quality monitoring, which Mark will be able to run through a little bit later on. As I mentioned, we were, uh, we'd set up these uh, 10 action groups. They had the focus of not only uh, looking at these particular themes and coming up with uh, um, certain local problems that they wanted to solve with uh, local solutions, but they, they had one other aspect that they needed to attend to, and that was uh, that the problems were not only uh, local, but they could have an international flavor to them. In that sense, uh, to look at other neighboring countries that might be uh, suffering with the same uh, aspect, and to bring that together and share those results and those experiences across borders. And indeed, not only from an African point of view, but also from a European point of view, where there are a lot of these similar experiences and a lot of these similar problems have also been faced. So as you can see, we have action groups that are set up from the North, West, East, Central and Southern Africa. For us, it was really important to have an idea. We have 10 action groups that are working on particular local problems. Um, so to us have an idea of exactly what they were working on was really quite important. And one of those ways of doing that was uh, to ensure that there was a form of reporting in a very simplified uh, manner. And uh, this is done through the Afri Alliance online portal, through the uh, reporting platform called Really Simple Reporting that was set up by ATPO, ATPO. And, um, and basically what it allows is for each action group to, uh, to quickly detail exactly what they've been doing, um, how they've been solving their, their, their problems, and uh, what are some of the objectives that they've managed to achieve and the impacts that they've uh, created at that level. And in such, we've, uh, we've managed to have um, real insight from these uh, 10 action groups from, uh, from across the different uh, parts of, of Africa on exactly what they have been doing at those uh, local levels. And as you can see from, uh, from these uh, reports here, that uh, it was bringing together a, a number of different uh, actors uh, across different uh, scales in, in order to either implement um, different water quality monitoring uh, type of aspects to, to have a look at what are the different types of um, 
uh, agricultural responses that can be done at the local level and to various other different uh, aspects that, that can be taken into, uh, into account. But one of the more important aspects with regards to an action group wasn't so much how they were set up, what, that, what they were doing in terms of running and how they were being able to, uh, to do their activities and report on those, but was to uh, under, have an understanding of how they could potentially remain sustainable after the, uh, the funding from AFRI Alliance was, uh, was, was finished. So, um, so we undertook a few studies and Matthias is going to run through those uh, with you now just to give us an idea of how these action groups could potentially remain sustainable. So over to you, Matthias. Uh, thank you, David, uh, for this very nice introduction to the action groups. And well, uh, um, hello again as well from my side. I'm happy to present you shortly what we have done in NARFI Alliance through a collaborative approach to foster the sustainability of the action groups. Um, so as you may know, it's important to uh, that doing, but as well at the end of a project, efforts are made to ensure the sustainability of, of action groups. And with that objective in mind, um, during the project, we have undertaken two main activities. At one side, we have done a World Cafe uh, with participants of the Afro Congress held in Uganda this past uh, February, before all the craziness, <laughs> craziness started. And um, we did as well, uh, in a collaborative approach, the co-development of a business model for the action groups. Um, but what did we address doing those, uh, doing the World Cafe? We addressed four main points. Uh, first, the factors to facilitate the setup of action groups, then the success factors of the action groups, but also the challenges uh, of um, that monitoring and performance can have, and finally, the long-term sustainability of those. Um, I could talk to you about many points uh, that came out uh, during the World Cafe on each of those specific topics, but I'd like to f um, highlight only a few. When setting up an action group, key organizational and economic facilitators are those that obviously contribute to the self-sustainability of those action groups. And that, in fact, relates uh, and aligns very good with the success factor of an action group including having a clear leadership, face-to-face uh, -face interaction at the, beginning, at the beginning to create good uh, bonds and, and connections between the members, a clear governance structure, accountability, and clear funding mechanisms. But it's not only that, only, only that but um, to foster innovation, in the, it's important to understand and target the local needs and translate them into sectoral gains. Um, giving space to that for failure and, of course, involving local actors. Remarkable is also that um, indicators and monitoring is not it's not so easy as sometimes thought. So um, it's important to have it clear at the beginning of an action group and as well during the, the development of activities to know uh, what, when and how to monitor and ev ev evaluate. Finally, to achieve the long-term sustainability, um, we develop a business business model to have and and identify the leaderships of of the activities that could uh, take place um, after the end of the project. So we did exactly exactly that. No, how can action groups become sustainable? after the project uh, lifetime. Um, at first, we said um, the first step was to assess if, if, uh, if action groups actually want to continue their collaboration. And if so, if there's still work to do regarding the purpose they came together for. So if there's nothing, uh, nothing to be researched or done for on the purpose they came for, there's no need to, for them to stay together. Um, if the, but if that interest is, interest persists, on once the project is uh, coming to its end between its members, and uh, it's important to 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 create stronger bond, bonds and alliances between those members to see how to face the future challenges. A second step is 
um, was to uh, co-design and develop a, a business model for the action groups and to identify uh, a clear leadership um, within the FB Alliance who would be willing to contribute uh, to guide uh, the action groups once they are uh, they are at the end of the of of the project, and, and within those business models, we included aspects of uh, of of, of um, short descriptions of of the action groups, the social impact that they can generate, but as well um, financial requirements and income streams that uh, that are important for for could be important for the action groups as well as the uh, partners that that they could uh, come together with, or uh, other market, uh, um, other action groups that could have a similar niche in, within the market. Um, I showed. I hope that that brief uh, overview has helped you. And if not, um, I'm happy to answer your questions later in 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 the chat. I'll hand out hand over now to to Luke who will uh, present you briefly the outcomes of, of your MOOC regarding sustain the sustainability of the action groups. Thank you, Matthias. Thanks very much for, for running us through that. Um, so uh, Matthias just ran us through some of the, some of the sustainability criteria that uh, was identified during uh, during some of the other activities relating to the action groups. Um, and I'm about to go through uh, some of the um, uh, some of the um, some of the findings that we got from our, our previous MOOC, our massive open online course. Um, so previously earlier in the year we held the, the MOOC uh, titled Social Innovation in Water and Climate Change in Africa. And uh, so this MOOC gave us a lot of insight into the, the, the different action groups, um, particularly relating to the sustainability of the action groups, as we had over, over 850 participants in this MOOC. And uh, many of the participants were based in Africa and they were practitioners or policymakers and researchers. So we really managed to, to get a, a, a very deep pool of, uh, of knowledge relating to, to water and climate challenges and uh, related the, this knowledge to action groups. Um, so one of the modules of the MOOC was, was specifically focusing on action groups and one of the best ways to get, um, to get insights from our participants was through the, the interactive discussion forum that we held uh, in each module. Uh, so we drilled down into the uh, uh, into the action into the um, uh, discussion forum uh, of the of this module of the action group module uh, to see what our participants uh, thought about sustainability relating to, uh, to action groups. So firstly, we can see that uh, that community involvement and uh, and building uh, um, broad consensus amongst a range of uh, organisations was really a, a key a key factor in the sustainability of action groups, according to our participants. Um, they suggested that, uh, that not just consensus was needed, but uh, involvement of uh, a broad range of actors from an early stage in, in the action group process uh, during the co-design uh, and defining objectives was a key, uh, a key point here. Um, further than that, uh, we can see that the learning processes and capacity building is also forms a key point of action group sustainability, um, according to our, uh, our participants. Um, the need to learn from failure and the space to, to fail and, and learn from that was, uh, was raised many times by our participants, as well as uh, the implementation of continuous and ongoing training and capacity building for the local uh, stakeholders and uh, people involved in uh, our action groups. Uh, additionally, monitoring and evaluation was a key point that was raised, uh, particularly ongoing and long-term uh, monitoring. Um, uh, in order to uh, to observe the effect of the action group and to measure the objectives up against the progress that was being made. And finally, uh, our participants suggested that communication was a key point um, relating to the sustainability of action groups, in particular long-term, uh, the ability to create long-term communication plans and to use this communication um, to secure uh, longer term funding and, uh, and the, the overall sustainability of the action group. 
So besides the, the discussion forums uh, that I previously mentioned, uh, in our MOOC, we, uh, we also offered participants the opportunity to create their own case studies. Um, uh, and they could create their own case studies on anything uh, relating to social innovation in water and climate change. Um, and many of our participants related their case studies specifically to action groups and action group modules that they had previously learned from. Um, and many of these case studies are available now on the Afro Alliance website. Uh, we're uploading them uh, every week. Uh, and uh, this week is the, the final week, uh, the final group of, of case studies that we're uploading. Uh, and so in total, we have over 30 case studies from our participants. And they're uh, incredibly high quality uh, publications. So I think uh, if you go onto the website, you can, you can take a look. And uh, there's a lot of information to choose from there. Um, but I would just like to highlight one that we uploaded last week that was, although it wasn't focused in Africa, it gave a really great example of, um, of the creation and uh, establishment of an action group, um, this time in Colombia, and also touched upon key points of sustainability within action groups. Um, so again, this is on the Afro Alliance website, um, and you can find all of, our, all of the case studies uh, that we uploaded there. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'll just hand over to, uh, to Mark now. Well, uh, greetings from Africa, and um, in the room with me are my, some of my colleagues, and online hopefully some other of our uh, delegates who've attended some of the, the course that we worked with here. And um, we, we can't see the full list, but hopefully when we get to the uh, open question and answer session, we might have some more engagement there, but we're looking forward to reporting back to you on just some of our experiences in the context of the Ubuntu Action Group um, under this project. So uh, good afternoon to you all from Southern Africa. So um, my name's Mark, Mark Graham. There's a bunch of us involved in this project. Uh, Jim Taylor sitting on my left here, Stephen Ellery across the way from me, Ayanda Lipiano is hopefully online, uh, Charlene and, and various others. Thanks. And really what this sort of community of practice focused on was a number of uh, Key, key dimensions. One principle was a fresh workshop. This work spun out of the um, a earlier process, which was related to um, the AFRESH, which is the African Freshwater Alliance uh, for Streams and so on. And we were looking there principally at developing and highlighting some of the citizen science tools that could be used by communities of practice in the monitoring and assessment and measuring of water resources at a local level. So very, very much a community citizen science focus. And the key part of that training workshop, which we'll talk to just now and show some of that output was the development of each of the delegates at the end of it had to have worked up after the four days, I think it was a, change project that they anticipated taking home with them and applying in their local context where they could actually start some of this monitoring and so on. And we're going to highlight two of those. Stephen's going to talk to that. One from the Western Cape down south of us here um, in South Africa and another one, Lake Rukwa up in Tanzania. And uh, Stephen will talk to those. We'll also then highlight in this, through this community of practice the development of a number of case studies where some of this work has been able to be continued and into a wider network. Um, Education for Sustainable Development and the Expert Net training course that's emerged out of that. And also a more recent project, the C40s project, which is the Climate Finance Facility and their interest in trying to develop some material there that would be useful in the climate change perspective in Africa. So we'll talk to that. So thanks, Luke. Next slide. 
So this group, um, and you'll see that some of those shiny faces just now, that's Africa there. We had a number of colleagues from all over Africa, Mauritius, Madagascar, Tanzania, Lesotho, several from South Africa, and even a colleague um, out of Italy. Um, so a nice wide distribution, European and African uh, delegates on that. And uh, we had this regional training workshop. Thanks, Luke. That workshop was held here in South Africa. And what we really were fascinated by was this concept of the SDGs and how could we take this new paradigm, the SDGs, and, and integrate the, this SDG thinking into the tools. And we were particularly interested in tool, uh, the SDG number six, clean water and sanitation. And how could we measure, how could we evaluate, how could we engage with this as a community of practice? Uh, 63.2 is talking about monitoring of water resources and these citizen science tools clearly um, were entirely appropriate there as monitoring tools. Thanks. And we'll see some of those in action. Thanks, Luke. So this is just some photographs um, and pictures from that fresh two training workshop. Um, very much a coming together of different individuals from different member states around Africa and, uh, and very much a sharing of ideas and experiences with their own citizen science and water quality monitoring and the introduction to a toolbox of different tools that we've been co-developing with a number of partners over many years and sharing those tools and how we could use those for water quality monitoring. You see some of the individuals in the last three photographs there presenting their change projects and what they anticipated being able to do and show with, with some of that. And I'm going to ask Stephen, thanks Luke, to talk to some of that and give us some feedback on those change projects. Great, thank you. So um, this is just a photo of all the delegates who, who um, made it to the Fresh 2 workshop. Uh, yeah, I think that's quite a, a, a wonderful summary photo of um, the diversity of ages and backgrounds of the people who came to the Fresh 2 workshop. And Luke, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so the first change project that uh, we would really like to share with you guys is the Western Cape Change Project which uh, was run by um, actually uh, one of the government institutions down in Cape Town. And um, it was run in the Berg River catchment, which is a really important water supply catchment for the city of Cape Town. And um, the, the project aimed at um, kind of empowering the six, six primary schools and three high schools um, with the citizen science tools and those uh, citizen science tools that were used were the clarity tube that you can see pictured up in the top uh, right and then mini sas uh, and also the velocity planks um, and they chose five different water quality monitoring locations and each school is responsible for monitoring the water quality on a quarterly basis in those areas um, yeah, and then they report back to centralized uh, the Friendship Conservation Trust um, and they report back their results to them uh, and then the Friendship Conservation Trust will then link that information uh, to other people who need. Uh, Luke, if you could go to the next slide, please, that would be great. And so then the Lake Rukwa Change Project uh, is based up in Tanzania. And this was a partnership between the Lake Rukwa Water Board and then six secondary schools uh, in the area. And these, uh, and so they provided citizen science training uh, to the schools and to the Lake Rukwa Basin Water Board. And uh, they have now set up six different water quality monitoring sites on inflowing rivers and streams into the Lake Rukwa um, itself. Um, so yeah, th those are some really cool and exciting change projects that came out of the Afresh workshop. I'm now going to hand over to Jim Taylor, who will talk to us about the lessons learned 
and where we are going from here. Thanks, Drew. Next slide. Well, greetings, everybody, and my name's Jim, and lovely to be with you this afternoon. And thanks for all the really helpful introductions, David, Luke, and Matthias. So my colleagues, Mark um, and Stephen, have overviewed the Fresh Workshop. And what we're now trying to do is say, what have we learned from all this work? Um, we've learned to build on existing networks rather than create brand new ones. Action learning has been a key component of this as well as co-engaged action, working with people and developing ownership by working together rather than sending messages to people. And we're finding, I'm hoping that our colleague Ayanda Lepiana is online with us and may chip in a bit later, but he and I are finding that indigenous knowledge processes are really helpful in building understanding. Thanks, Luke. So we've been invited by Etegweni, which is the greater area of Durban. Um, hopefully you've heard of Durban, one of South Africa's biggest cities. They're doing a C40 project, which stands for Sustainable Cities, and integrating socio-ecological learning um, using the toolbox that Mark referred to. And you can see in the toolbox, there's MINISAS, the Stream Assessment Scoring System, using biomonitoring, and in that little chart at the bottom, you can see the many different parts of South Africa where many SAS tests have been done and put on the Google Earth plane. Thanks, Luke. So, Iand has been leading a process of training and viral champs who are public spirited community members in the, one of the catchments near Durban, the Palmeet. And because of COVID, they weren't able to meet. Um, most participants don't have laptops and Ayanda was able to develop a system of learning using WhatsApp chat, um, simply with mobile phone technology and local area networks um, to, to do the teaching. What we found there is people soon became skilled at sharing voice messages, text messages, and participating. It would be quite exciting to see if, uh, if Luke's MOOC could extend into a, um, a phone-driven uh, MOOC. I don't know of any MOOCs globally that are driven on phones, but it is possible. And that could be an innovation that we develop forward here. So there you can see some of the people working in that catchment. Um, We've asked Ayanda to chip in later. I uh, hope you're there, Ayanda. Uh, next slide, please, Luke. Perhaps I should have added most of the training is done in Isi Zulu, um, one of the more popular local languages of our area. And there you can see the, it has a very much an inquiry based training, so a question driven curriculum rather than a a content-driven curriculum. And it's, it has a strong emphasis on question-guided learning. So the questions that the participants are asking become um, a feature of the, of the learning together. Thanks, Luke. These are just some images of the people working together. Um, those living in close proximity with each other um, were obviously conscious of social uh, distancing, but they then worked in pairs, as you can see, um, sharing their mobile phone technology, making notes, and then sharing um, either text notes or voice notes with each other around the topics of the online learning. And um, enormous richness of um, of sharing took place through the course. Thanks, Luke. The group also did some practical work in a stream in the Palmeet catchment. And you can see Ayanda in the middle of that picture there. Um, and obviously people are wearing masks. Uh, we're living in COVID times. 
but we're still able to get out to the stream and use the clarity tubes to measure turbidity and of course do a mini SAS test there. Next please. So these are just the five T's of action learning. You put the topic of the learning in the middle and that bull's eye, the red um, dot in the middle. In this case, it was learning about the palmate catchment. And then around that, there are five T's, um, encouraging people to think about what's going on, talk about amongst each other, tuning in, um, connecting with the historical aspects of the catchment. How was it looked after in the past? How has it changed? What's going wrong? Of course, the fieldwork encounters as part of touching and then taking action as a strong component of this kind of action learning model. Thanks, Luke. This is a strong slogan that comes from the apartheid era in South Africa. Um, either teach one, reach one, or reach one, teach one, really emphasizing if one has something to share, who and how can you share it with anyone? And this was a strong kind of um, collective slogan in the way that the training took place. So to spread the learning as much as possible, especially for people who weren't connected um, through Wi-Fi and laptops and so on. Thank you. So we also made a range of indigenous language videos and video clips. Some of this work was supported by ExpertNet, which is a global movement for education for sustainable development involving Mexico, India, Germany, and ExpertNet is giving support to expertise around um, YouTube style video clips, which can be produced in indigenous languages and can help us bridge to the, the SDGs that Mark emphasized earlier. Thank you. So where do we go from here? Um, Stephen recently ran a, a wetland assessment training program. Um, that map on the left hand side of your screen is South Africa. And we had participants from all over South Africa, 35 of them did this course. And then they also met in collective clusters at local wetlands to situate the learning with practice. So we're going to continue with those trainings. And then we're also affiliating to the United Nations University Regional Centers of Expertise um, and contributing to the citizen science agenda of RCEs globally. On the 30th of November, we're going to have an open um, Zoom course inviting all the 180 RCEs from around the world to participate in sharing um, fr from the kinds of experiences we're having and contributing their own ideas as well. Thank you. This little map is a diagram of the whole world and those little crab icons represent outcomes of somebody who's done a mini SAS, which is a stream assessment scoring system using indicator organisms or biomonitoring. And you can see that it works just about anywhere where you have perennial rivers or streams from Canada in the north to Australia in the east of that map. And you can see the little crabs occur on Madagascar and the Indian Ocean Island states of Mauritius, Zanzibar, um, as well as in India. So this kind of technology, this toolkit for measuring the uh, river health index through indicator organisms is becoming more and more popular. And the United Nations Committee responsible for SDG 6.3.2 are experimenting with using mini SAS as a global measure for all countries reporting into their SDG 6 um, which is the annual commitment each nation has. So uh, really quite exciting development there. Thank you. Yeah, so more information, we've put up some websites there. Um, um, ExpertNet is another one that isn't mentioned there, if, if people are interested in that. 
Um, it's hosted by Engagement Global in Germany, um, but there we've got the Afri Alliance, we've got African Freshwater, Ground Truth, um, and so on. And I don't know if you can do this, Luke, but we would really love to have Ayanda maybe say a few words. Um, if you're online, Ayanda, we can't see the participant list from where we are. Ayanda's in the field at the moment, and he may be able to contribute. Thank you, everybody, from our side for listening. And let's see if we can have a, uh, just a greeting to everybody from Ayanda and perhaps an emphasis. Thank you very much. Luke and David, we're done from our side. So we're up for questions and so on um, as they go. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, and uh, and uh, and and the rest for uh, for these uh, very insightful um, messages. And uh, <clears throat> I was uh, giving a little bit of space to see if Ayanda would uh, like to uh, uh, like to uh, mention something. I know that she should be able to uh, unmute herself, but um, in case uh, she uh, there was uh, had the ability to do that. But, uh, but if not, Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Ah, okay. Here we go. Facing everyone. Yes, um, I'm Ayanda Lipiane. I'm working for Ground Crew. I'm working very close with uh, Jim, Mark, and Steve. And Steven. Yes, we have been doing some fantastic uh, stuff uh, around the citizen science tools, uh, engaging with the community members. The project is like, it's uh, mobilizing the local community members to understand and address uh, local issues such as sanitation, water leaks, uh, illegal dam sites, and, and some other pressing issues around the informal settlement and communities. And the project has been sort of like driven mostly about the education for sustainable development uh, competent, like uh, system, system thinking, uh, anticipation, collaboration. And during the, uh, uh, like since the started of the COVID-19, we were planning to meet the people, uh, the local community members face-to-face uh, -face and running trainings. So we couldn't uh, manage to do that because of the regulation in South Africa. So we're not allowed to meet people face-to-face. -face. So we tried to use Zoom, uh, but there was no, people didn't have uh, laptops and all the centers, uh, like community centers with their Wi-Fi were closed. So we tried to use WhatsApp, which was like sort of a success. And during WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp chats, our trainings, we like we used indigenous knowledge to, because it was a, it's a, it's a powerful approach. Uh, for example, like we the people they we running training uh, to their meets. They got like their daily activities, and we when using this. Uh, running this training, we make sure that we link uh, trainings around the citizen science tools with their daily activities so they can make a connection and you don't want people to come to the training and then they for, they continue with their daily activities and then they're not making a connection. And we also you use the 5T action learning that the Jim did uh, talk about it. I think it's, it runs very well and we currently, people are using the science uh, people are sort of uh, summarizing the the training in terms of uh, like the appreciation approach, what they learn and how we can improve the the online trainings, and also doing the, some short videos in EC Zulu and EC Tosa. Yeah, I think that's that's all from my side. Just to mention a yeah, few things that we've been doing. Oh, very interesting, Ayanda. Thank you so much for uh, for that that intervention. And I think that uh, supports very well uh, what Jim was just uh, presenting now as well uh, about uh, use of different uh, languages, etc., in uh, communicating those those messages across. So thank you for uh, for that. And so I think you've been active in the in the in the questions. So this is great. This will give us a 
a nice uh, a nice opening to uh, to this uh, forum now we've got 10 minutes left so we'll uh, we'll run through um, those questions and uh, and we'll see how how best we can uh, we can go through that if indeed you have any other question feel free to uh, to put them down here in the question section uh, or indeed raise your hand and uh, and we can go through uh, through those as, as well and uh, the first one uh, the first question we have from uh, from Tia uh, Burtman, uh, where um, uh, the question is regarding the sustainability of the uh, the action groups after the EU funding stops uh, facilitation moderation of uh, action group learning and exchanges what suggestions are there for for that very good question. Thank you uh, for that. Indeed, uh, this is a this is something that we uh, we focused a lot on uh, in terms of the this last couple of years, where we had a look at what were the different options for action groups to uh, to continue, because we uh, we do realize that um, an important aspect of an action group is indeed the uh, the financing and the funding uh, moving moving forward. And there were a number of suggestions that have actually come out in order in order for that to to take place. Uh, one of them was actually to, and that was the the concept from the very beginning, was to bring action groups together with other uh, larger programs, uh, projects that uh, that they can align themselves uh, with. So we we're making sure that the topics that they're focusing on can be aligned with other types of programs where there's a possibility for uh, for funding to uh, to, to be. Um, to be brought in, in in that sense. Also, the other concept that we brought in with the action groups uh, wasn't um, the the idea of funding them completely for all of the activities. The the idea indeed was just to have a, some seed funding, so that it initiated the ideas, it initiated the uh, the connections between these uh, these different organisations and, and different countries, and then that uh, at least allowed uh, the action groups to spur themselves on. In order to uh, to search for um, the the other the other side of, of uh, funding that they might require uh, in order to do all of their uh, their activities, um, but as uh, as an action group that is currently active that is coming to the end of its Afri Alliance life, um, perhaps Mark, uh, you could give us another insight on how uh, you as an action group uh, are looking to uh, continue. Um, and how the aspect related to financing and funding uh, comes uh, comes into play. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, David. It's a very good question, and I think it's a perennial problem in this space. Um, but what we're seeing, actually, interestingly here, and it, it literally came out of a meeting this morning was that the Development Bank of South, Southern Africa, the DBSA, who are a major funder and they get a lot of European and uh, overseas funding into development projects. There's a stronger emphasis coming through there now on how, how does this development funding, uh, what is the dimensionality to that funding that has to be showing that there is sustainability in the funding? And in our particular project, what's really exciting is that we now, I think we've got some fantastic tools that have been developed, the citizen science kind of tools, which are able to illustrate the impacts of, firstly, the, it might be a you know, physical impact from an intervention, a structure, a building, a road, a pipeline or something, which might be impacting on rivers. And in our case, that's our interest. Um, um, so what I think is exciting in that space is that the funding requirements are now insisting on sustainability. And how do you measure sustainability? Well, the tools are able to articulate to that, talk to it. And I think the other dimension of sustainability is clearly community involvement and so on. So it's having developed a suite of tools that can allow for this work to take place and talk to funding mechanisms. And this might be the longer term mechanisms through those, through those processes of sustainability. Otherwise, I think it, it really boils down to um, using this kind of funding to unlock further funding to continue this kind of work. And it, it's been the nature of the work for the last half work for 20 years is that it's, it's unlocking small pieces of the puzzle uh, with small incremental budgets that allow 
bigger and bigger impacts and work to take place. So it's all, as I said, it's a perennial problem. I don't, there's no easy long-term solution to the funding issue for this kind of work and supporting it, but we just have to be creative about that. And I think, you know, we're thankful for AFA Alliance for allowing some of this process to continue. Indeed, I think, uh, as you mentioned, Marco, it's, it's definitely an, an issue in the in the sector as a whole. So not just something uh, specifically related to, to action groups uh, uh, as such. Um, so we have another uh, another question from uh, from Tia, and that um, how active are the action groups in West Africa? Presuming French-speaking countries would rather exchange in French. Um, indeed, we have a we have an action group that is. Uh, that is actually being led uh, by a Ghanaian institution. Uh, it's the action group uh, called Planning for Drought in Semi-Arid semi Africa. Um, they, uh, they are very active uh, and, uh, of course, being from, from Ghana, uh, a lot of their, uh, their activities are actually in English and they, um, they, they are connected with other institutions uh, and uh, other um, countries across um, across Africa that uh, are English speaking. So uh, in that sense, it is more on the English speaking side. Uh, just to also uh, mention that we we did launch uh, the action group uh, applications both in English and French. So we gave the uh, the same amount of opportunity for those uh, that uh, speak English or French to indeed um, uh, apply. Um, and, and it just so happened that the ones that were leading the action groups came out as um, as, as from uh, from English uh, speaking uh, countries. Um, but that's not to say that there are other um, Anglophone, uh, uh, well, um, Francophone, shall I say, countries that are um, that are participating. For example, Burkina Faso is uh, and Cape Verde is uh, well, Burkina Faso more, should I say, is uh, participating in the upscaling potential of uh, water harvesting across uh, across Africa. And, uh, and then there's also uh, Burkina Faso that has been uh, been involved in one of the first set of action groups, which is the Sustainable Intensification for Resilience and Food Security, the CRAF action group, where a lot of activities happened on the ground in Burkina Faso in that, uh, that action group. So although uh, not led by um, institutions from West Africa, there, there were um, uh, Francophone speaking countries that were involved uh, with, uh, within those. Um, in, t in, in the next question from Tia also came through to, uh, to say the Rural Water and Sanitation Network is another good network uh, to, to link to. Um, yes, thank you for that. Uh, we indeed, uh, in the Afri Alliance network map uh, that you can find on the Afri Alliance portal, we are linked uh, as, a, as a community, as a network to, uh, to this uh, network. So, uh, so one that we are aware of and, uh, and indeed are, are connected to. From uh, from Esther from uh, from Uganda, uh, just wanting to know how uh, how uh, she can be a part uh, of this and uh, and how indeed she can make uh, make change. So um, yeah, Esther, by by all means, uh, you can join uh, our community on the Afro Alliance uh, portal. And uh, and I think uh, Luke has uh, some of the final slides that uh, that we can show you that just shows you how to uh, how to that you can actually join the. Um, uh, the community, the Afri Alliance uh, community, and uh, and you can send us uh, an email, uh, and we can put you uh, you on that uh, that community uh, there. Um, and then uh, from uh, Leonardo Pincinetti. Hi, Leonardo. It's good to uh, good uh, the, to see you here. A long time uh, that we haven't uh, we haven't spoken. Um, Interesting how to uh, engage the MOOC and community uh, engagement. Definitely something that we saw is a uh, real potential. The, the number of uh, participants that we had from, from the MOOCs, um, as Luke said, more than 800 uh, participants uh, really is a, a great source of um, African practitioners to join in on, on, such a, on such a big movement in terms of water and climate activities in, in Africa. Um, and you've also given us a link to the FOSTA project, which uh, links into the Tunisia. So we'll have a look at that. Thank you, uh, thank you for uh, for that, and um, and looking at the different aspects uh, related uh, to that. Um, with the, uh, um, another question that we have here from uh, Witfach, um, 
thank you for the, the informative presentation and uh, challenging work despite COVID-19. Um, you are interested in uh, citizen science and any recommendations of uh, references and uh, tools on that. So with that one, Mark, perhaps uh, you would like to uh, take this question. So uh, the, uh, the question here is that if there's any recommendations, references or tools on citizen science. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, we've just completed a four-year research project on this with the Water Research Commission here in South Africa. Um, and that, that material is available free off the Water Research Commission website uh, and downloading of that report is there. Um, but more than happy to engage one-on-one -on -one with that question as well if, if that's not successful and just following up on our email, which uh, was on our presentation, um, info at ground truth, and we can more than more than happy to engage further with some of the tools and some of the resource materials that we've developed as part of that project and which fed through into this project. So, yeah, it'd be great to chat more on that. Thanks, Mark. And then we have uh, some final questions uh, here with um, from Pape. Uh, what, uh, what is the plan to duplicate the action groups in different uh, places uh, along the uh, continent? So from the Afri Alliance um, project, obviously, as you know, we're coming to the end of the uh, project. We, uh, we had the objective at, uh, initially to set up 10 action groups uh, across uh, the continent. Those, uh, those have been completed and are currently run, and a lot of them are coming to the end of their activities. But, um, but what we... Um, but what we have managed to achieve through that uh, time is uh, to give a, a different uh, concept to uh, not just creating and once a project dies, uh, the action groups die with it, but uh, rather to, uh, to let the action groups take control of their own future, uh, to provide the, the tools and, um, and space for them to collaborate uh, together and to create uh, further action groups if they see the, uh, the requirement or indeed to connect with other communities of practice that are currently running across the continent so that uh, these sort of activities uh, can in, indeed be uh, transferred to other parts of the of the continent and and some of these lessons learned that Jim has run through from uh, from their side that that can actually be spread and um, and exchanged with uh, with other uh, organizations that might be looking to set up uh, communities of uh, practice and then the final question is from uh, Mikkel um, where he says that I suggest some of you may have attended the virtual citizen science and SDG conference last week if so, what were the primary take-home messages from, from that event? So I personally didn't attend. I don't know if any of the other panelists uh, attended that, uh, that conference uh, last week. Uh, in case you have, then uh, perhaps you can, uh, you can give some of your, uh, your take-home messages. Yeah, David, none, none of the team from our side. Unfortunately, we, we weren't even aware of it. Uh, so a few surprised. So that was a SDG conference and citizen science. Um, yeah, citizen science SDG conference uh, apparently. Yeah, so um, so no, yeah, I wasn't aware of it, either, but um, but yeah. Okay, so it seems that these are all the questions we have, which is almost perfectly on time, just uh, four minutes over. Uh, so at this uh, uh, that point, I'd just like to uh, thank all of our uh, panelists, our presenters uh, to uh, today that have done a, a fantastic. A job and giving us a real outline of uh, of, of the action groups um, how they can remain sustainable and uh, and how exactly uh, the activities on the ground have taken place and uh, and some really amazing uh, work that has been done by the Ubuntu action group from uh, from ground truth in uh, in South Africa and all of their uh, their colleagues and uh, collaborators there as well so before we uh, we close off this uh, this webinar just like to let you know that uh, Afri Alliance is running a series of uh, webinars that might be of your interest. Uh, these will be running through uh, the, the whole of November and uh, December, where uh, we'll be looking at different uh, aspects from the needs and solutions hub to the triple sensor approach, will be, which will be done both in English and in French. Uh, looking at the geodata portal and uh, other Afri Alliance uh, databases that can be of uh, a lot of interest in case uh, you're looking to uh, 
have uh, areas of uh, knowledge uh, repositories that you might uh, be looking to to attach to and then the final one is a, a data journey approach to uh, development programs so you can register for those at that link uh, there and um, and the, this information is obviously available on the Afro Alliance website and you can pick up everything there or indeed from the uh, the Twitter or uh, uh, LinkedIn pages from uh, from Afri Alliance so with that um, I'd just like to thank you all for uh, for attending uh, remember that you can uh, join our community from uh, from the Afri Alliance uh, website and uh, hopefully see you at the next uh, Afri Alliance webinar. Thank you.